I want to welcome everyone to the concluding session. Um, not that this will be a determinant session, um, but a time to start to gather some threads together. Uh, we have a panel. Each person is going to give about 15 minutes of reflections, or maybe less. Um, we have with us uh, a couple of people we've already heard from in some capacity this weekend. We've got Mark Redfield, who's the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities here at CGU. Um, Randy Ramal, who also teaches here at CGU. And joining us as well is Edith Vasquez, who is on faculty at Pitzer College, where she teaches variously in English, world literature, gender, and Chicano studies. Um, so we'll hear uh, from this panel for a total of about 45 minutes, and then we will invite um, Judith to come down from her perch in the back and uh, offer her um, reflections on the conference as a whole. Mark. Um, I, I'm going to stand over here because I actually do want to be able to move these slides. Um, so um, um, I was wondering how a literary theorist like myself could best contribute to this conference. And I decided um, that the best thing to do would be to offer a couple of thoughts about the self-figurings of this colloquium, plus a comment or two, or actually just one comment. This is going to be less than 15 minutes, okay, which I imagine is a relief. Uh, about the uh, never quite stable role of figurative language in the production of philosophical discourse and maybe picking up on uh, uh, dialogue that was just started. Um, I promised on Thursday to say something about the photographs we've been seeing, so I'll start there. Um, and I do want to say um, quickly that um, what I'm going to say is um, sort of, I'm trying to address sort of some of the sort of um, discursive norms productive of a conference like this. And I want to stress that in doing so, I'm speaking with great admiration for the conference, for the papers that were given. And if I'd had a uh, longer time to write something up and prepare, I would um, have produced a paper that was sort of more traditionally about um, the two great bodies of work that are uh, the occasion for this meeting. OK, um, so first, self-figurings. Everything I have to say under this heading should be understood as homage to the fine touch of Dina Lin, who in addition to delivering a fine paper yesterday on prehension, precarity, and feeling beyond the frame, was also responsible for plucking the images that have been displayed in rotation on the screen here from the archive and assembling them to produce a visual frame for this event. I think she did a wonderfully thoughtful job, partly in making visible the processed character of these images, from the cured, gleaming, leathery background, ambiguously reptilian and human, to, um, if I get this right, the bizarre, slick, silver and red Whitehead Research Project logo. I don't know if it's an official logo. Uh, to technically produced and technically reproducible detached phalluses, as I read them, <laughs> engaged in some, some sort of erotic or athletic play. The photographs, the photographs also telegraph their processed nature, but they do so more complexly and in different ways. And as a pair, a queer heterosexual pair, they can be read as acknowledging and reperforming certain desires and tensions that a conference like this sets in motion. First and most obviously, there's the desire to bring together and put side to side, side by side, two philosophers. One of them, since our context is the Whitehead Research Project, is necessarily Whitehead. Um, the other is X, and here Judith Butler. The possibility of a radical incompatibility between Whitehead and X has been ruled out by the very act of pairing, by the ampersand, the coils between in order to join together these two proper names, Butler and Whitehead. Of course, some contrast and even some regional conflict between these figures is to be expected, 
but at the end of the Commedia, they are to be joined in a philosophic marriage and folded within the same neutral cora. I'm trying to be provocative so as to, so we can have something to argue about. Uh, saying the same thing in different voices. And generally that has been the tone, if not always the literal substance of the papers we have read and heard. Um, although um, I, I think Michael's paper today was, was, was uh, an interesting exception. Uh, but uh, even there and even in any paper you could imagine, I think, uh, such compatibilism is built into the assignment of writing an essay on Whitehead and X for such an occasion, and if I were giving a proper paper, I too would be uh, indulging in it. Uh, but last night, Judith Butler pushed back a little, and I would be curious to know, this would be a question I'd forward, whether she believes there to be any point of genuine incompatibility between her thought and Whitehead's. The photographs tease us nicely on this point. These two philosophers are not just side by side, they are also both accompanied by bags. They have packaged up their philosophies and are bringing them along. <laughs> but the rhyme goes jangly in other ways, of course. Whitehead has his briefcase firmly in hand. Butler may or may not belong to that suitcase. <laughs> and then there are all the other obvious contrasts. On the one side, an elderly white man caught moving frontally toward the photographer's left, clearly in the corridors of power. Harvard, as it happens, I've been told. Um, although I'm also kind of pretending I don't know the context, that, uh, because they, these, the whole point is that these images circulate anonymously on, on the internet um, um, with various degrees of recognition depending on their context. Uh, though it, uh, so he's moving frontally toward the camera, though also clearly exiting soon, and behind him, arm in hand, repeating his arm in hand, is another man, and behind him another, and behind him another. The men die, the institution lives on. Um, on the other side, uh, a figure somewhat harder to read, even though you know who it is, she has been stylized by the spare frame of the photograph to the point that she reminds one of a poster advertising a film, even. A bittersweet comedy, perhaps, with an existential undercurrent. Uh, she also seems to be in transit, but stalled. Uh, she gazes in profile towards some unseen object or monetary presence. Perhaps she's been causing trouble. These, <laughs> these images certainly seem to be living in different worlds. They do have one, at least one more thing in common. As I noted a moment ago, they both announce themselves as images. Their mode of announcing their technical reproducibility is a little different. The Whitehead photograph presents itself as archival. The Butler photograph presents itself as manipulated or processed. Uh, Dina added the red background, which um, makes the, the, the face and the, the bit of the left hand uh, gleam with a kind of otherworldly um, pallor. Um, both circulate past the knowledge and control and past the literal or potential lifespan of the two human beings who at two different moments were taken up into the regime of photographic representation. Two lives have had their singularity at once recorded and effaced in and through the iterative powers of various overlapping sorts of reproductive technologies, photography, digital reproduction, and so on. And thus, in a sense, the paired photographs once again promise a certain shared communion, if only as the uncontrollable process and possibility of iteration. The photographs offer one final allegory, as I see it, of a colloquium's animating desire. They promise to give face to a body of work, to embody a corpus of texts. Um, which is kind of punned in the suitcases. Uh, um, and in the, particularly in, in the right-hand side, the suitcase and the clothing are of the same color as though there's a, a rhyming there um, because of the way the photograph's been processed. Uh, da, da, da. Um, they, they perform visually what the endlessly reiterated proper names Butler and Whitehead perform in our conference papers the construction of the identities, Butler and Whitehead, that can be paired, compared, contrasted, and joined. These names fully play out the role of what Michel Foucault famously called the author function. Both of these authorial names, of course, are being used 
to signify process, flux, all the other themes of the conference, but such themes are arguably being contradicted by the rhetorical form of their presentation. The possibility that Whitehead is not Whitehead, not always Whitehead, or Butler, Butler, that for instance other voices might sometimes haunt or possess them, rarely flickers into view. Here too, the photographical montage nicely repeats and remarks the shaping norms of a conference. And now I have an appendix that doesn't have anything to do with what I just said, really, although I was hoping to make some connection. But um, in closing, let me offer just a tiny appendix on figurative language. As several speakers, most of all Jeremy Fackenthal, um, have noted, Whitehead draws attention to the unformulability of first principles. Quote, words and phrases must be stretched toward a generality foreign to their ordinary usage. And however such elements of language be stabilized as technologies, they remain metaphors, mutely appealing for an imaginative leap, end quote. Such emphatic, if unsustained, invocations of the metaphoric texture of philosophical thought form part of the philosophical tradition, of course. You might think, for instance, of Kant commenting on symbolic hypotyposis on section 59 of the Critique of Judgment. I know that's what you were all immediately thinking right now. <laughs> um, I want to comment on just one such instance, the rich word occasion, which has played such an important role in the last few days. Etymologically, it means a falling toward. Uh, and uh, here's a quote that um, Judith Butler worked over beautifully last night. An occasion is a subject in respect to its special activity concerning an object. Nicely unpacking and animating this phrase, Judith Butler commented last night that, quote, the term occasion rises up, we might say, from the antinomy of subject and object to establish a third term, process or activity, without which neither subject nor object would make much sense. Both Whitehead and Butler deserve credit for stretching this word. And wanting to add my might to this conversation, I did what any literature professor would do. I looked up occasion in the OED, in the Oxford English Dictionary. One entry was a shocker. Uh, now I'm going to read it. Quote, personified as a female bald behind, especially in to take occasion by the forelock, end quote for the moment. Um, <laughs> part of the weirdness, and I'm sure some slightly malicious lexicographer was having a bit of misogynistic fun here, is the OED's decontextualization of the phrase, a female bald behind. I had to read it twice until I understood that female was a noun, not an adjective, and behind was an adverb, not a noun, and that the image was one of a female allegorical figure with hair over her forehead but none at the back of her head. The examples from texts such as Marlowe's Jew of Malta make this clear. Quote, this is Marlowe, begin betimes, occasions bald behind, um, or quote, that lock which men say occasion hath growing on her forehead being bald behind, end quote. The moral here is that linguistic acts of resignification can sometimes do more work than you might realize they're doing, as you do them. I doubt whether Whitehead or Butler had this grotesquely misogynistic allegorical figure anywhere <laughs> in the back of their minds as they reflected on occasion, but their reflections add up to a powerful demolition of this figure, which is of course that of a subject, a sovereign subject, violently seizing, perhaps we should not call this prehension, right? Uh, violently seizing occasion as an object. When the occasion becomes, quote, a subject in respect to its special activity concerning an object, that violence falls out of a falling together that may not even know what it has accomplished. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank uh, Roland Faber for uh, organizing this very um, <coughs> creative and diverse conference, Daniel Perez for uh, uh, putting things together and keeping us informed about the progress of papers and so on and so forth, and also all the uh, Whitehead Research um, uh, Process staff who <coughs> made this conference possible. I'm extremely honored uh, to be on the final panel and to have also participated yesterday in the conference. I speak with some trepidation because, I, as I mentioned yesterday, I haven't read a word of Butler, um, but I'm intrigued and I'd love to read it in detail at some point. 
Um, as we know, Whitehead uh, considered the history of philosophy uh, as a series of footnotes to Plato, and I think for good reasons. We have certainly witnessed uh, the importance of Plato and the references made to his work and uh, thought in various conference papers, both explicitly and implicitly. The Cora of the Timaeus being one explicit and methodically discussed example. The treatment of language, or at least the reference to the treatment of language in Credulous being another example. The grammar of violence in the Gorgias and the implicit idea of power as an illuminating category of explanation. The reason I want to mention Plato is because he, in my reading of him, was very much interested in the question of the growth of understanding, which for him was tied up with growing through conversation, discussion, dialogue, and criticism as well. He fought the sophists <coughs> for creating the threat of turning philosophy into sham discourse, a threat that Derrida also addresses uh, in his last interview, Learning to Live Finally. The university, <coughs> Derrida tells us, is about the search for truth without any conditions attached. And it fulfills its purpose when it allows us, quote, to be free, to know, criticize, ask questions, and doubt without being limited by any political or religious power, end quote. I think this conference <coughs> has pr proved Derrida right and that the dialogical spirit of Plato that Whitehead so much admired has been present in various forms of becomings, displacements, and departures. Different but related conversations had taken place during this conference, some focusing more on Whitehead, some on Butler, but together I think they exemplify the growth of understanding that Plato had in mind. We have seen how reaching out to the unknown and the uncreated provides a renewed opportunity of dialogue between Butler and Whitehead, not necessarily for a guaranteed outcome, but for exploring possibilities of growth. Speaking of both the infinite with a capital I and of medieval forms of touch and undoing created the dialogical experience of reaching out to the apiron on the one hand and to the Jewish idea of God as the one who is not fully spoken. The question was raised, can we have a theory of mourning that relates to the eternal possibilities which are enclosed in the infinite? The question promises further discussion and possibilities of growth. It is important to emphasize that the physical absence of Whitehead did not hinder widening the possibility of undoing in his thought, pushing the latter beyond the discursive limits of substantiality in subject, subject, in subject, excuse me, object grammars to include ethical concerns that allow growth in his systematic thinking and in our <coughs> understanding of that thinking. Physical absence is never an obstacle for process thinking because the past with its memories in the present, including the text itself as a memory, are always actual data for possibilities of growth. <laughs> Having Whitehead's picture on the big screen also helped, I might add. We uh, have also been reminded, albeit not in the same exact words, that for Whitehead, partial truths are opportunities for growth into larger, rounder truths. We grow when we ask questions, the answers to which contribute to our unity of understanding. And some of the questions that were, at, that were raised in this conference include, who has the right <coughs> to speak on behalf of Terry Scheibel, also on behalf of the human infants whose rational consciousness is still in the making? What of other marginal cases of human and animal existence? <coughs> other questions were also raised. Which lives and deaths are grievable and do wars and terrorist, uh, and terrorist acts make a difference in how we appropriate grievability. How do we create a social ontology beyond the traditional frames of understanding? And on what basis can we claim that the economy of exchange in our capitalistic societies require elements of gifting that can be theorized with the help of Butler and Whitehead? More questions will be voiced below after addressing some of the ones just mentioned. People do not lose humanity if they lose their consciousness, Whitehead and Butler tell us. Consciousness presupposes experience, not experience consciousness, Whitehead reminds us in Process and Reality. Feelings, intuitions, and precarious states of being are ontologically primordial. They require an element of touch that is also a relation of care. We are sentient beings, as are many animals, but we're also socially constructed. And understanding 
why we react the way we normally do to other things, to other beings, human and non-humans, will require further discussions, further opportunities of growth on conceptual and, exist and existential levels. We have learned that Whiteheadian systematization of ideas could be put off, could be off-putting, off-putting, sorry, and threatening to the understanding of ordinary forms of power that are associated with vulnerability, victimization, and market-based forms of violence. But we come to appreciate the idea that systematization is not always rest restrictive because power, even a vectorized one, could be a luring concept of presence whose systematization means relating it to other ideas of coherence and consistency. We come to value the idea that for Whitehead, growth in understanding is about creating conceptual unity in our thinking about notions of power, perception, feeling, and the body. But what have we learned about the body? How did the flow of discourse in this conference transcend the opacity concerning the difficulty of referring to the body? If the body has been misplaced and forgotten in theological closets and Lacanian forms of signification, did we achieve a unity of understanding in regards to its grammar? The religious images of coming out stories have been intriguing and humorous, and we need that for what White had described as a sense of adventure in his work. On the serious side of discussing gender and sexuality, Whitehead's suggestion of seeking simplicity and distrusting it has brought to the fore Butler's view of the need to acknowledge opacity in sexual identity, which I think could fruitfully be discussed in relation to Sartre's notion of that faith, and therefore opening more conversations and discussions between Whitehadians and Butlerians. The body has also been discussed as both the organic receptacle of language, and in Whitehead's theory of symbolism, as in Whitehead's theory of symbolism, and the dancing sign that is both ontologically primary and socially constructed as a butler. It was pointed out that in their common rejection of Lacanian modes of signification, both Whitehead and Butler acknowledged the need for something outside of signification to give our understanding of the body its desired platonic unity. And there are differences about the starting point for discussing the grammar of the body Butler giving the social body a logical primacy that Whitehead does not seem to, we have seen nonetheless how the centrality of the body in discussions of the relation between language and reality is important. But the difference also points out the need to further examine Whitehead's views on language and perhaps considering the critique of analytic philosophy that we heard to explore further Whitehead's views on language. Finally, what a delight it has been to situate a poetic exploration of the self as a body itself, as, as departure at the end of the conference um, presentations. What other proof, I asked, do we need that if language breaks down at moments of metaphysical accountability of the how of things, albeit true, this in itself is not a reflection of a deficiency in language, but in our inability to think clearly. Why not think of the body in a spiritual way as it was suggested to us? Or as uh, Gertrude Stein teaches us, language itself can intentionally be used to unsettle language, language habits, where the failure to appreciate the unsettlement, unless aesthetic, is not the fault of language itself. I'm also reminded as I end my comments on philosophy and language of Franz Rosenzweig, his book, Understanding the Sick and the Healthy, where he accuses philosophy not rather than language of creating sickness in common sense thinking, precisely due to ignoring the role of ordinary language in contributing to the growth of our understanding. Rosings, uh, Rosenzweig himself couldn't help but do philosophy in his work, and he had mainly Hegelianism in mind when he attacked philosophy, as well as Weniger's als ob philosophy, and other ideas drawn from materialism, empiricism, and positivism. We hope he would not have included Whitehead's and Butler's mode of thinking on his list of disease-causing philosophies. <clears throat> but he's a good reminder, I think, as have the extraordinary papers proved in this conference that without discussion, dialogue, conversation, and criticism, that aim at real discourse rather than sham discourse um, <clears throat> is always uh, in, in waiting for us uh, as a dangerous possibility in the way that the sophists were that kind of danger. Thank you all for opening this possibility of growth.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for a chance to address the body here of the conference. Um, I have been, my time has been uh, somewhat limited, and, but I have read pa the, the papers and have been present for more than a few of the talks, and it's been very, very exciting. Um, I, I'm also very pleased that I followed the, uh, my two colleagues here, one who made me laugh, <laughs> Mark, um, and, and um, uh, Randy, who, who raised uh, the, the issue of language and, uh, and also uh, expressed some poignant thoughts um, concerning um, the breakdown of language. And I thought of this in connection um, with uh, the, um, the perhaps uh, uh, more important question, I mean, or broader question, which is whose lives are grievable? And um, because I needed some of the uh, of but Butler's uh, concepts, definitions, um, texts to support me in many ways as a teacher, uh, as an as a kind of academic research activist, um, I've often found a surplus of, of vocabulary, uh, of terms, of critiques in Butler, and have been teaching her to undergraduates. Uh, at the Claremont Colleges for several, for a couple of years. I wanted to give a bit of a, a background to my work as a teacher um, uh, in the field that I work in, in which I'm currently focusing on a, on a, a topic um, in sapphic uh, Chicana Latina writings and kind of um, considering Sappho's in this project, um, which is for um, a project called the Chicana Matters series out of University of Texas. And um, the first occasion I had with University of Texas was in a collaboration with an editor there doing the, the most recent collection of Gloria Ansaldúa, um, uh, which is published posthumously, and, and having lost Ansaldúa at a time when, uh, uh, I, when, when, our com when feminists in my community did, um, I thought it was appropriate I might mention the way I wove Butler into a reading of Ansaldúa and did so um, with, I think, what I would call Butler's sort of first stage, uh, uh, a scholarship pre-9-11, as I said to Randy, and the work I'm more familiar with, having left graduate school four or so years ago and being behind my graduate, um, gr uh, graduate student colleagues here who are more up to date. Uh, but I've had more practice, I think, on the ground, if I want to call it that, which is teaching Butler to um, hesitant, younger, uh, uh, um, introductory level students in my course. Um, um, you may know that I have, I'm having a little difficulty concentrating, and I, I wanted to confess to all of you, because she is here with us, that for the past three semesters in which I have taught Butler, I've come under investigation um, for um, problematic course content, and that cre presently, at this moment, I was, I, I was, I've been censored, and I've been removed from the classroom just at the point at which I was teaching Butler and Iri Garay in connection with uh, Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, um, there was opposition from a, one or two students in a very large course uh, at my instruction of, of feminist methodologies and feminist uh, discourses. And because what took place when we brought Edie Garay, Butler, and Toni Morrison into a classroom, um, um, I realized why we we're all here, I mean, why we, we worry or we have anxiety over the state of, of affairs in terms of what our philosophers and our critics and our theorists can actually do to change, to change our society. And that when that change is made possible, when it's, when it's uh, articulated and practiced, that it will come under uh, uh, swift and decisive discipline. Um, 
I, I, um, well, I saw this emerge over a period of, of three semesters, and I didn't want to believe it could be taking place in the 21st century, um, but, it w but it did take place. And so the volatility, the potential dangers and, um, and, and risks of, of us applying concepts that our, our philosophers and our philosopher feminist scholar critics produce for us uh, does, does not go unmonitored and does not go unnoticed and does not go uncensored. I, I recollect, I, I, I realized that in teaching to Beloved for a third time and sort of being annoyed in a moment when I felt the novel was, was didactic or was pedantic, and many of you are familiar with that work, um, the main character of which commits infanticide to, to prevent her child from also becoming a slave. And this is a slave novel, which Morrison herself um, spoke to in the introduction to that novel. I want to write a book about slavery, but it's not going to be um, a, another slavery uh, novel. It's going to be about that child who, who was who was spared by her mother through murder. So um, um, in recollecting the most vicious of the, of, the, of the characters, and recall it's a novel in which there are white slaves, but um, in recalling the most grotesque of the, of the, of the uh, villains of that novel, um, uh, uh, I, 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 I found myself a little annoyed with Morris, and I thought, why does she continuously say this school teacher is a uh, is, is a terrible villain, the worst of all, you know, among the other um, the others who cooperated with uh, you know s s slavery or with abuse of slaves? But this one particular character stood out over and over, and I I, I realized that the third time. That the, this third investigation, which was taking place, was the very thing Morrison was writing about, which was the school, a character named the school teacher, an educated person who would oversee, document, and describe, in a neutral fashion, the 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 um, the, the sexual violence committed against Setha, the main character. So. Um, uh, I, I, I suddenly realized <laughs> that that school teacher was the institution, the institution in which I, I had come under great scrutiny and in uh, um, which I had, I had asked to, to be concerned about my academic freedom. Uh, I don't know, I feel as if I'm almost in a <laughs> sci-fi novel right now because I can't believe it's, it, it, it's, it's true, but I, I, I'll go on to something perhaps more relevant to our discussions here. Um, but I don't, think what, what, I don't think there is anything perhaps I could say that's more relevant, you know, because for, out of my experience as a woman, um, uh, of Mexican and, and Native American descent and mixed race descent, I, I uh, Butler is a is a kind of a hero, an icon, somebody who gives vocabularies to the things that we experience or embody as women, and that we we can find co-equals of in this deep philosophical um, uh, 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 alphabetics that she would provide. And then we can apply that to the texts uh, written by women. And um, I, I, I guess I can't get beyond that. I, I wanted to, I tried, I wrote a talk, I put it aside. Um, you know, I wrote another outline and I put that aside and, um, and I couldn't get around that fact. So uh, I think then that that must be a great, a, a, evidence of a great contribution by Judith Butler to, uh, to our society. 
and it, and 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 but which is what which is what I believe institutions are at least a microcosm of. So um, um, in connection with teaching undergraduate women, because my courses tended to be uh, predominantly women with a, a two or three men who, who, who came along and, and who participated and who were good students as well. But, but um, teaching this to young women, that is to pre uh, married or unmarried women to unassigned women, unass women who are not yet assigned into a, a reproductive order, like you know, young adult women. Uh, this, this, you know, uh, it, it 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 was profound. It was profound. It unsettled one or two students, and 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 I was gone the next day. So. Um, I'm sorry to give such terrible news to everyone. I, I think from what I've been told, this had never been done in, in many decades. And uh, uh, in, in, this, in this college where I work. I wonder, because my goodness, when will I ever have another chance to quote Butler to Butler? And maybe the, the writer, the writer shrinks away from writing, you know, from a, an earlier period. But um, people trouble, oh, perhaps trouble need not carry such a negative I valence. I need new glasses. <laughs> to make trouble was within the reigning discourse of my childhood, something which you never do precisely because that would get one in trouble. The rebellion and its reprimand seemed to be caught up in the same terms, a phenomenon that gave rise to my first critical insight into the subtle ruse of power. The prevailing law threatened one with trouble, even put one in trouble, also to keep one out of trouble. Hence, I concluded that trouble is inevitable and the task how best to make it, what best way to be in it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for your collegiality and your and, and your audience. And and um, it's a great honor to be uh, in the presence of one of my teachers, though I've never met her, <laughs> Judith Butler. Thank you. Well, I, I want to um, thank everybody um, for this great honor and, and this great opportunity to uh, think anew about so many things that I had not um, given proper thought to before. So this has been um, uh, quite interesting and, and provocative in the best sense experience for me. Um, I just want to say to Edith that I am um, alarmed and dismayed to hear that you uh, have been in any way censored or um, stopped from teaching on the basis of uh, the materials that you include in your classroom. And um, I think the only way to handle that is actually through um, summoning up networks of vocal solidarity, um, not just here, but, but throughout um, the academic profession. And I'd be glad to talk to you a little bit about how we might do that. OK. Um, <laughs> hey. Well, I, my, I, I have a sense that there's a sisterhood of, a sisterhood of trouble, no? Uh, okay, so I think it's a moment to call upon the sisterhood, and I, I believe in, in such, um, s I believe in strong vocal acts of resistance, um, and, I, and I'm sure there are many things we could do and many people we could contact. Um, so I think it is important, perhaps, that I maybe take up, finally, um, the question of, well, what are the differences, especially when they may well revolve around the problem of difference. <laughs> and um, and I, I do think that there are um, uh, moments of disjunction, um, maybe genuine incompatibility. I don't know. I myself am um, a changing target, so it's hard to know what Butler's position is, and I'm the last to know, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I do want to say one thing about the photo. Um, I think it's important to note that we're both hunched. And 
and that um, there's a question of which, which kind of versions of masculinity are in play in, on both sides of the frame. I, I think you were just too polite, Mark, to say that, but I'm in a, I'm in a uh, we're both in suits, although mine is an Anne Klein petite, I believe, <laughs> and, and his is not. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm somewhat diminished and indeed um, maybe even a kind of Woody Allen equivalent within <laughs> the lesbian, you know, philosophical circuit. Um, and he also is not, he's going somewhere, but he's not quite erect and I think both of us lack erectness and maybe that's, that's something, <laughs> that's something to, be, to be noted. Um, okay, that, that, those are just my, my brief remarks on that. Um, I was struck both yesterday, I believe it was Jeremy's uh, presentation, and then today with um, um, Christina's, uh, trying to think about, well, mm, what happens when one tries to give an account of oneself, or how, how, what's the, what, what are the alternatives to narrative? And, and, and um, Christina suggested that clearly poetry is a non-narrative mode, and that's true. And, I'm particularly struck by the, um, the way in which apostrophe functions within poetry when it does. Um, the you to whom a poem is addressed is, is, is not a you that exists exactly. It's, we might say it's the figure of the you understood as not yet existing and not yet anywhere. Um, and so something about space and time is suspended and reconfigured through the um, apostrophic gesture uh, within, within poetry more generally. Um, I like the idea that poetry is tempor temporally mobile um, and that lyric poem uh, proceeds through leaps and associations. I would also say, interestingly enough, um, that in the work of Gloria Anzaldúa, um, who I knew and um, even partied with on occasion, um, that there were really important questions um, about moving between prose and poetry and also between languages, which also I think raises the question of translation, which is also a non-narrative mode and a very interesting problem, especially if we're going to turn uh, to the question of difference. I remember teaching La Frontera in a class and the students would say, well, we don't, we don't speak Spanish. And, you know, she, because she writes in English, she moves into Spanish and then she actually moves into um, Mestiza native uh, uh, language, so they're actually three different languages, and you're asked to move actually quite quickly and without introduction from one to the other. And the ones who well, I don't really speak these languages, I don't see how I'm supposed to read them. And um, and of course, what what you're up against is reading through something where you don't understand, and you are suddenly dislocated from your dominant cultural position in a in a quite stunning way. And what and even the ones who said I don't speak Spanish turned out to understand a lot of what they read, because they're living in a world in which Spanish is being spoken, and it's it's um, it's entered their horizon even without their knowing. And and why would they say they don't know when they do actually know enough, enough, you know. Anyway, I, I think it, it raises the question of what we know and don't know um, explicitly there. Um, I think what I would like to talk about briefly um, is this. Um, I mean, I think it's always, it's always usually a bad sign when people try to use poetry for ethics. But maybe the question is really um, what ethics can learn from poetry rather than the other way around. Um, if, if I can't just say who I have been, if I can't give a coherent account of myself, um, but I still vocalize, or I still seek to say something, or I still seek to tell something, then maybe um, something about me is, um, comes forth in vocalization. Um, the telling, say, of my history doesn't exactly collect the past for the purposes of a coherent presentation, but telling itself becomes a kind of present instance of, of, um, of self-giving or of giving the self over to, to whoever the you is through language. And um, we can understand that as a giving forth or as a, even as a bodying forth, um, presupposed and enacted through a certain kind of address. But one critical question emerges here 
And I mean, I think I'd like to take up the question of whether body and language are but two modes of symbolic, uh, of symbolism. I want to say symbolic expression, but I'll say symbolism. Um, but there's another question, which is um, uh, what happens in the halting or the stammering by which, what, how do we account for halting, stammering, um, uh, ellipsis, lapsus, um, uh, even paralysis? Uh, in, in a mode of address, uh, interruption that's not synthesizable, that never is recuperable. Um, uh, what's the counter rhythm to concrescence? What, is there an opposite to concrescence that's not already contained within the term? Um, one question for Christina, can there be temporalization without iterability? And can there be iterability or even more commonly reiteration, right? I tried to reiterate what I saw and knew the, even the moment the pelican, the pelican on the waters, when I when we say that as the evidence of Whiteheadian presentation, immediate presentation, we're recalling something from somewhere, and each of you are being recalled to a to a, not if not to that instant, but to a similar set of instances, and so we're trying to bridge a temporal gap through language. Right? We're not just giving you the image; we're we're trying to recall something you've already known. Oh, how do we understand? That that ability to invoke and reinvoke in in the present through language, can there be reiteration or representation without some loss and some displacement? After all, even if I say the pelican, the pelican rising up from the 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 shining waters, <laughs> pelican's not here. Right? If anything, we are aware we're inside of a room without windows and. It would be nice if there were a pelican rising up, but. <laughs> and we can make it rise up in a way, but there's also a way in which we cannot make it rise up here and now, and we don't have that power, and no language does. And isn't there a kind of loss, or isn't there like a, like a displacement that makes possible the invocation, and that also kind of keeps it from being a truly, uh, a truly a presentation of the phenomenon itself? So, um, and, and, and Christina talked about the temporal halt. So how do I, is there, is there something in the notion of a temporal halt, um, like a sudden ending, um, an apparatic conclusion, or an unfinished sentence that is a counterpoint to concrescence? concrescence? Um, <coughs> is there a way that the this of the now becomes the that of the past, although sometimes it persists as the this of the past? And how do we account for this difference? And does it matter? I'm going to give you two poems by Wallace Stevens. The first one, I think, is perfectly Whiteheadian. The poem at the end of the mind beyond the last thought rises in the bronze distance. A gold feathered bird sings in the palm without human meaning, without human feeling, a foreign song. You know, then, that it is not the reason that makes us happy or unhappy. The bird sings its feathers shine. The palm stands on the edge of space. The wind moves slowly in the branches. The bird's fire-fangled feathers dangle down. May or may not be perfectly Whiteheadian, but my guess is that Whiteheadians would like it. But here, what about this one, this particular stanza from Sunday morning, Stevens's, Stevens's rather long poem? She says, quote, but in contentment, I still feel the need of some imperishable bliss." End quote. Death is the mother of beauty. Hence, from her alone shall come fulfillment to our dreams and our desires. Although she strews the leaves of sure obliteration on our paths, the path sick sorrow took, the many paths where triumph rang its brassy phrase, or love whispered a little out of tenderness. She makes the willow shiver in the sun for maidens who were wont to sit and gaze upon the grass relinquished to their feet. She causes boys to pile new plums and pears on disregarded plate. The maiden, maidens taste and stray impassioned in the littering leaves. Okay. And there it seems to me that it's not just that um, there is perishability or that um, uh, um, that uh, there, there will always be some obliteration of the traces of the past. 
but also more radically that death is the mother of beauty. So if we were to go back to that pelican on the water, it's precisely it's not being here, which allows it to be here in, in the poetic phrase. How do we account for that not being here? Um, I want to suggest this um, in thinking about language and the body, that perhaps even if we take sig signification as the model, and I remember Derrida himself addressing me many years ago, we, we no longer talk about signification. <laughs> okay. And I was like, okay. Um, we might still have a problem understanding um, a certain kind of gap. Even if the sign signifies the thing through substitution, it turns out the substitution is based on a difference that cannot be properly manifested. There is something that must be crossed over, something, mm, something perhaps even ineffable, if we're to draw from a th certain theological discourse, uh, something ineffable that separates things from one another and allows the one to recall the other, the one to associate to another. There's a question for me about um, whether presentational immediacy is the same as association. There's another question of how Whitehead's notion of causal efficacy actually works. I think I probably don't subscribe to a notion of causal efficacy. Um, and I'm aware that although some people have focused on that notion, causal efficacy, others focus on association, and I wonder whether causal efficacy and concrescence are completely compatible ideas. Um, when we say that the hand of a settled past forms the present in some way, is the present caused or is it formed, and do we care? Is there, is there, is there some important difference between causation and formation? Um, how do we account for the settled past, the sedimented past, in its reiteration, producing something unexpected, the new, the unanticipated? Does that not call causal efficacy into question? How is, and this may just be my ignorance, how is ca causal efficacy on that model related to the introduction of novelty, which I know is so important to Whitehead? Um, I want to suggest um, that a past Mm, the, a past acts on the present, a past, a past forms the present through a set of occasions reiterated, um, and that in reiteration there is obviously distinctness. It's not completely continuous. If it were completely continuous, how would we explain the new, the unprecedented? How does something unprecedented emerge? How, and of course we say the tree, but what if we were to say something like justice? Um, what if our ideas of justice are always changing and actually we come to think about something new as part of justice that we never thought about before? Look at what the disability movement has done to our ideas of justice. Look at what lesbian and gay marriage rights have done to our ideas of equality. Were they, were they always the same or are they changing? Are they reiterated and, and altered through time? Okay, so Here's, an, here's another and related point. I think it's odd to talk about the actual body and the culturally constructed body as some kind of separate, separate kind of thing. Um, because let's think more carefully about what cultural construction is. Um, what does it mean when we say that a culture constructs something? Through what means? Through what modality? What if it turns out that we can't talk meaningfully about cultural construction without something like the occasion, even the repeated occasion, one in which the sedimentation of the past stages its renewal, but also stages the possibility of a departure from its past, producing the new. Is this production of the new not in some way made possible by a difference, a difference that's opened up through the reiteration of occasions? Can we talk about e associations between one thing and another without assuming a difference among them, an enabling difference among them, which allows us to see, discern, make the connection? Can we even have specificity without difference, without negation? If signification as a model is wrong, then it probably has to admit to some truth within its own terms, and hence to show, even if by its failures, the alternative it is not yet thought through. 
That's why it probably doesn't make sense to contrast signification with symbolism. They would have to be linked. The one would have to be, in some sense, articulating the other without knowing it. Do we really want to say that it's pure relativism, relativism to say anything can invoke anything? Well, if we think about how memory works or how association works, indeed, um, I may, I may have, um, I may have, have, have lost someone dear to me who wore glasses like these. <laughs> how is it that my loss can be, in some sense, relayed through glasses like these, and for you, not at all? How do we take seriously those kinds of associational chains that are part of consciousness and surely are part of anything William James would have called consciousness? Right, surely. If we're going to talk about the temporality of consciousness, then indeed anything can invoke anything, and it is quite astonishing that that is true. Certainly Freud's interpretation of dreams tell us, tells us that that's true, a very important difference from Jung, for instance. Um, okay, so what I want to suggest then um, is um, that I'm not sure um, that we can also distinguish the order of metaphysics from that of culture or language. To what extent, again, could we use something like the occasion or even a, an idea of, um, of convergence uh, to talk about how and when metaphysical truths are presented in very specific kinds of cultural forms, right? Whitehead's the one who teaches us you're not going to have metaphysics at some abstract level and then particular instances of cultural forms. You're going to have the one informing the other and presenting itself through the other. At least that's my understanding. Otherwise, we would be guilty of a certain kind of abstraction. And one of the things I'm learning is that Whitehead has, um, has offered us a way to rethink metaphysics um, against its contemporary criticism, and I hope to be able to have a chance to think more about that as well. Um, I think, um, lastly, I want to um, uh, go back um, to this question that perhaps death is the mother of beauty and what that might mean. Um, I think it, um, it poses a challenge for um, uh, the idea of, of um, eternal objects, of the idea of the imperishable. I don't know if there is a kind of Parmenidean bias in Whitehead. I'd be really interested to know. Um, I, um, I, I don't have that answer. Um, but I would, like, um, I would like to invite us to think a little bit about, um, about how, how we think about the perishable, um, the the line in um, the, the line in in Stevens um, begins. She says, "But in contentment, I still feel the need of some imperishable bliss." Um, Death is the mother of beauty; hence, from her alone shall come fulfillment to our dreams and our desires. Although she strews the leaves of sure obliteration on our paths, what is not retained? What cannot be retained? What cannot be recuperated? How do we understand not just the traces of the non-recuperable, but the non-recuperable for which there is no trace? How, how do we understand that? Um, uh, I, I was moved to see that my, um, my sequestered piece on Benjamin, in which I talk about sacred transience, was discovered. I didn't think anyone had ever read it, but that's really nice. Um, and, um, and it's true that I looked, I looked at that fragment from Benjamin to think about what sacred transience might be because it seemed to me that he was um, uh, trying to understand uh, what it would mean to accept um, transience um, as a kind of rhythm. And I realized that in Whitehead too, perhaps this musical motif of rhythm or um, uh, it becomes one way in which uh, one comes to terms with uh, perpetual loss. But, and, and indeed, even in Hegel, very clearly, um, when he talks about life being shaped and dissolved, there's a, a rhythmic pattern, right? Life and death are in a rhythm. So there's still some 
there's still some symmetry. There's still some um, there's still some music that's possible. There's still some structure or form or m mel melodic metaphysics that can em em embrace and sustain life and death. Um, but what about atonality? Uh, <laughs> what about what about um, what about dissonance? What about the non-rhythmic? Do we rule it out as not possible? Or do we seek to accommodate it to make to make some room for it in our understanding of temp of temporalization, which seems so key to our thinking here together, and and which indeed links me to this project, and I, I hope in a way that's been interesting for you. I want to especially thank all the graduate students who not only handled all the physical dimensions of this conference, including ferrying me around and making sure we're fed and, you know, um, being so incredibly efficient, but who also wrote fabulous papers and are among the most thoughtful and interesting grad students I've come across in a really long time. So I'm really honored and, and pleased to have been here, and I thank you. Thank you.